Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food and drink lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Cheese State University. Cheese State University was created for dedicated cheese professionals seeking to deepen their knowledge, sharpen their skills, and build connections. Join them in the Ivy League of Cheese Education at cheesestateuniversity.com. So you don't shun the devil with your rock and roll load. Knows that country music's gonna save your soul. The devil's grooving them rhythm and blues that sound. It's gonna get you sun in the end. Welcome back to The Speakeasy. I'm Damon Bolte. And I'm Greg Benson. And Souther is... Who knows? He's probably on like SpaceX by this point, like opening a bar on the moon. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. The guy's always up to something. Yeah, <laughs> Amori Margo Lunar. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, coming to the Sea of Tranquility in uh, in fall of 2023. How does he do it? How I, does he do it? I t- I don't know. Actually, I do know. It's just that I think he's just very tired a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah, that must be it. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking this morning about how he wrote his first book, or maybe all of his books. On his iPhone, he doesn't own a computer. He's got yeah. this entire book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think. Well, he's he's finally accepted that the computer of Natalie's that he's been using to do the podcast for, uh, I guess, since the pandemic. Uh, he's finally accepted that that's his computer because <laughs> she got tired of loaning it to him, and it's an old, busted up machine. So she just got a nice new one. So I suppose he now finally he does. He still hasn't purchased. A computer. This is basically, you know, one step above finding a laptop in a dumpster and taking it home. But he does <laughs> own a laptop now, so good, good for uh, him. Good for our colleague. Good. It's good, but also it kind of takes some of the charm out of it for me personally. It's true. Well, I'm sure he still does most <laughs> of his writing on his iPhone. We'll have to we'll have to ask him when he's back from his uh, from his lunar voyage. I'm sure um, if he had it his way, it would just be like a stack of bar naps. Uh, with a bunch of scribbles on it, you know. That's how I roll, man. <laughs> yeah, just kind of like, yeah, like a real like Jack Kerouac scroll, just kind of like turning in all these like, you know, waterlogged, just, you know, naps from like yeah. various different bars and just be like, here you go. Here's the manuscript. It would be great if you just like printed that, you know, like don't take the notes and, and type them out. Just like actually just like take photos of all the bar napkins and just make a book out of that. Yeah, or if the book is just like, it's like the various chapters are stapled together, napkins, <laughs> and then the whole thing is yeah. just held together by like one of those big alligator clips. Yeah, I'd buy it. Yeah, I would totally I'd go to the Strand and buy that. Get him to sign it for me. I get some inspiration for that, and uh, you know, we can we can talk about that when we do the Speakeasy book. Actually, why haven't we done a Speakeasy book? Why haven't we done a Speakeasy book? I'm just realizing that. We we should. We've got, we've got one in a... a, a were you writing a book? Am I hallucinating about this? Were you writing a book at one time, or is this is this me just uh, losing my mind again? Yeah, but then I went out. Ah, oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that'll happen. Oh man, speaking of going out, man, I um I went out with some friends yesterday for uh you know just just a quick drink, and I wound up getting home eleven hours later as one does, and yep. it's just and it's weird because I actually for the first time doing that I wasn't. I actually didn't 
have that much to drink. I had six drinks over the course of the like 11 hours that I was out plus uh, you know, a pretty big meal. And I wound up with, uh, I, I ended with a, a 50, 50 and then a Gibson at, uh, Alfred's, which was delightful. Um, but That's amazing. Uh, I love that you ended God. with those. Yeah. <laughs> that that kind of tells you what, what, what pace you were on, you know, like, the, <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's, it's just a very, a very steady, like eight minute mile of drinking the entire time. You but like it's... Benjamin buttoned your drinking session. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I started with a shot and a beer and I ended there. Um, <laughs> no, but it's just like, it, it makes me, it makes me really curious. It's like, why, what is the psychological thing that we do to ourselves when we lower our defenses and we say, I'm going to go out for just one, because no one has ever in the history of humankind done that successfully. And I'm just like, it, it made me very curious. Like there has to be, and it's not just me, like this is, this is a running joke. And I was even supposed to catch up with a friend uh later on that night and i told her i was like yeah i'm gonna go out and grab some happy hour drinks with uh with some friends but like just one or two so i'll be around later on tonight she's like yeah you're not gonna make it i was like no don't don't doubt me i totally am and i texted her at like 9 30 from like the third place we're at i was like yeah i'm 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 not gonna make it i'm sorry i'll catch you tomorrow <laughs> but just like why what happens in our brains when we delude ourselves into thinking we're going out for just one. I don't, I don't know. Well, it's the whole, like, well, you know, you ended your night with a couple of different martinis, you know, in that old saying, like one's not enough. Wait, what is it? Three's too many. And one's not enough. Wait, what is it? <laughs> What's the yeah, saying? like one is not enough and three is too many or something like that. Or, I can't remember. I, I always say that, you know, when it comes to martinis, I like I'm, I'm watching that, that saying it's like, uh, one is too many and three is not enough, I think is what the, uh, the actual saying is. And I always say, <laughs> yeah, that makes more one, sense. One's not enough. And three is also not enough. Um, but you know, <laughs> it, it, I, it, to me that I, personally, I, especially now that, you know, like everything, like live out here in Northern California, everything's so spread out that like, I can't just go have one, two. I, I can say, I, I can easily say, yeah, I'm only going to have two. But like, I don't want to take up a bar stool. Okay, think about this. You know, when we had uh, Laura Newman on the show, uh, like last year, and she was talking about uh, training new bartenders. Yeah. And how much money it costs to actually train a new bartender. And she was talking about staff retention and how important it is to keep your staff on. Because, you know, you put all that effort and the work in and the passion in with, with your staff. You want to make sure they're happy and like have benefits and if you can, you know, and, and all these things. I will, when I'm behind the bar, if I've got friends there and they're having a good time, I, I will just keep giving them, I'll give them drinks just so I don't have to clean the bar and reset it for the next people to come and sit down. Uh -huh. It's like to me, so I don't want to do that to the bartenders. So, you know, I don't want them. It's like less work for them if I just stay there and drink. You know what I mean? Like, no, totally. Yeah. The weird and way also, of thinking about it. But, you know. No, and like, and like what you're saying about like how things are so spread out. Like I, I don't, you know, I live down in South Brooklyn now, so I'm not in the middle of nowhere, but I share a border with nowhere. And mm -hmm. like, it is, it is uh, a trek to get into Midtown from where I am these days. And so when I'm there, it does feel like a bit of a waste to like go all that way and be like, well, I'll just have like a drink and then turn around and go no. back. So, uh, and then of course, you know, as you said, one is too many, three is not enough. So then you're like, well, I'm already here. I might as well. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, my thing lately has been, um, and it's it, like, not, not that the highball is anything new, but uh, I've just been drinking dry vermouth highballs, which are delicious. It's like the new vodka soda. Uh, not that I ever drink vodka sodas, but, you know, it's like, it's one of those things. It's like, it basically sobers you up. It's so like low ABV. Um, but you know, there's so many good vermouths out there that, you know, and there's, it's a totally, it's a respectable drink, you know, it's, you know, good vermouth with a little bit of seltzer water, nice garnish. I mean, come on, what's wrong yeah. with that? Then, then you can have more than one. You can have more than five and <laughs> still be like good to drive a school bus, you know, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, man. Like, yeah, I, but going back to your point, like, yeah. Like, why would you? 
why would you go out for just one, especially in a place as magical as New York City? I don't know, man. In the time yeah. before this, when I said I was going out for just one, I was going to McSorley's, where one drink is two drinks. So Actually, already I was yeah. setting myself up for failure. So yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's. I think we like we like to tell ourselves that, like, oh, you know, I'm gonna go to the gym later. My friend who I was going out with is also. Uh, I was out with a couple other like, you know, food and drinks writers and journalists last night. One of them was like, yeah, no, I literally like left the dock open on a story I was working on on my computer to be like, I'll come back to this when I get home at 8 p.m. I don't know. I think it's just uh, it's <laughs> it's there's something maybe we like setting ourselves up to be a little bit bad. Like maybe maybe there's something fun about like saying we're going to be good later and then like knowing in the back of our minds that we won't and then getting to be like, well, I guess I guess I'll just misbehave a little bit tonight. I guess I'll be a little bit naughty today. Like, I don't know. I think maybe that's part of the it's a little it's a little um, trick we play on ourselves to our own surprise and delight. Maybe that's yeah. where it is. It's a little mischievous. It's almost like, uh, you know, making New Year's resolutions that you're going to break and you know you're never going to follow through on, um, at least not for a full year, but at least in a, in a snackable amount of time, you can, <laughs> it doesn't feel as like impactful if you break your resolution for the day or the night. Exactly, exactly. Um, and speaking of uh, surprising <laughs> and delighting and a little bit mischievous, um, we are very, very, I know, I know. I worked on my segues last yeah. night while I was out. Segway that was the one thing career. I told myself when I came home from the bars, I was going to work on my segues and then I didn't, but I still <laughs> managed to nail it. Uh, in the studio with us today, we have the one and only uh, B Bradsell coming to us live from London and uh, also of the Drinks Cabinet, which is based in my former hometown of Glasgow in Scotland. So B, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. I do think that's one of the best intros I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Surprising, delightful, and mischievous. You can put that on a business card. That's yours now. Yeah. Um, for sure. I do need to get some new ones printed, so great. The station's a 501c3 nonprofit, so like everything's free. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, yours. that's yours now. <laughs> and, that was, and that was tax deductible for me to give that to you. So yeah, exactly. Everything works out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so B, I have to, I have to confess that, um, it took me a while to put some pieces together about your background because you were introduced to us by actually our, our guest last week, the one and only Chalky Tom, who is also, uh, delightful and mischievous. Um, and she mentioned- And, and lives that, in London. And lives in London. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, and she mentioned that your big sister was the espresso martini. And I just kind of was like- LOL, we all love espresso martinis. Isn't that funny? And it took me a little while of communicating with you to put together that and what your last name was and realize what she was talking about. Um, so give us a, a little bit of your of your background because you were sort of very much born into uh, this industry. So talk a little bit about kind of growing up with that and then taking taking your place in where you are now. I do feel that it's slightly my fault. I am always the last person to say it. I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, ter I'm terrible at doing the like, oh yeah, no, I'm here with the name, but um, I've just kind of gotten on with things and quietly in the background. Um, but so yeah, my dad is a bartender called, well, was a bartender called Dick Bradsell, um, known for such drinks as the espresso martini and the bramble. So um, the espresso martini, that does make her my big sister. Um, <laughs> I, uh, my dad didn't really know how to be around kids, but he did know how to train bartenders. So by accident, I've kind of been in the industry my whole life. Uh, <laughs> I always said instead of teaching me to do the dishes, he taught me how to speed polish. Um, <laughs> and, you know, not building a salad dressing, balancing a cocktail. It was always kind of... As soon as I started working in bars kind of full time, I realized how much I'd been in training my entire life. So I, yeah. I unofficially say I started at six, which is when I started making cocktails at their house parties. Not tasting, just making. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then I officially started with him when I was 13 and I bar backed for him for years and years on events before deciding that I was going to do something completely different, went off to university and then graduated and realized that interning is horrible and i wanted to make money and work in a bar mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> fell in love and the rest is history <laughs> um, really but that's been about oh god 
oh no, I don't, I don't even want to think about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's been a say while, it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but it's been a really interesting time to get kind of. I get to see London's uh, drinks uh, cocktail world really adapt. Um, you know, when I first graduated and really got started, it, there wasn't a cocktail bar in every corner. There were quite a lot of cocktail bars, but now in England, you literally cannot move for cocktail bars. Every pub, every bar, every restaurant is serving cocktails now. It's just wonderful. Um, and that definitely wasn't there when I started. Uh, and, you know, it's a, sure. it's a great industry that I've managed to travel the world with as well. Um, my mom's American, so I can work in America. So, and I um, worked at the Dead Rabbit in their second year that they opened. So I, wow. I started just after Bobby and Pam left. I think I crossed over with Pam a little bit um, and then was there just as Jill started. Um, so it was a great team to have. Yeah. Um, and then then sadly I had to come home to come take care of my dad, but um, you know, then got stuck back into the, the London bar scene. And since then I've gotten the opportunity to travel around and talk about his drinks, talk about the drinks industry as a whole, kind of going any, any, anywhere anyone will have me, I'll always go. I just um, spent the last part of the year traveling to Dubai a lot, working with the team at um, Zuma, who are absolutely incredible, uh, and working on their new espresso martini serve, which was great. Nice. I mean, I was speaking, I was going to say that like you're uh... – your older sister's been getting around a lot lately, uh, mm. <laughs> as it turns out. What I mean, what is first of all, let's let you know the the espresso martini has been around a lot longer than people most people realize. But like lately, it's had this like huge resurgence. I mean, what do you think that is? Like, why? Why? <laughs> well, there there are a few different ones, really. So, I mean, the original story it was created in. Um, uh, 19, well, 1980 something. Um, mm -hmm. No one in the 80s seems to have any memory of when anything happened. Um, <laughs> in fact, yeah. Jake Berger has written a book about how if we can't remember when the espresso martini made how was made, how can we say that we know when the old fashioned was? Um, right. Which, I mean, fair. But um, so it was the early 1980s. This is kind of I'm early to mid is. All I'll say, and the then, late um, early '80s. Yeah, that that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and a my dad had just had a new um, coffee machine, new espresso machine installed in his bar, which was called Soho Brasserie. Um, and it was as if they'd had a new rotor app. No one knew how to use it. Um, <laughs> it was the fanciest of equipment, and the bar was an absolute state, completely covered in coffee. And then a young unnamed model, not Kate Moss or Naomi Campbell. Um, came in and asked for a drink to wake her up and fuck her up. Um, and um, with a bar already covered in coffee, coffee was going in that drink. Vodka was the drink of the time. And kind of he shook that together with some coffee liqueur and thus the original drink was formed. I think it's about 1984 because he said that the David Bowie film Absolute Beginners was being filmed at the time. And that was released in 1985. So from that, that's my guessing at time um but then it kind of just disappeared into the background with him he took it everywhere he went that drink was actually originally served on the rocks um mm. and then as the 90s trend for putting absolutely everything in a martini glass came True. along he he turned he added it there um and it became the espresso martini his final final recipe he um had it match bar i think in 1999 um so it was one of the first match group drinks. Um, and um, they uh, he then took it to Damien Hurst's bar where they were asked for a drink to, wanted a pharmaceutical inspired menu for a bar called The Pharmacy. And my dad decided not to do that and just to give nice drinks new names. <laughs> so it the pharmaceutical stimulant. Um, because people want to drink nice drinks. They don't want to drink, you know, medicinal ones. Uh, unless it's a good whiskey. Um, You're talking to the guy with a Fernet Bronca tattoo, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, there are a few things, but like as your average cocktail goes, sure. um, and especially for, you know, 1990s British drinking crowd. I don't, yeah. Um, but then that was, so that was the original. And I think that it never really took off then, but then um, it kind of 
yeah, low level, just continued on menus. And then I think in Australia, where they are absolutely mad for coffee, it took over there. And then we were we were still kind of dealing with the bar that we were working in together. Um, people be loving the brambles. And then we just get more and more people coming in asking about espresso martinis normally australians i've had people being like come in like flown all the way from australia come in on my dad's night off and i'm like sorry i'm his daughter though and they're just like you know wanting to like shake my hand just because i was related to him <laughs> that was kind of my first taste of like oh my god what am i getting into um and then then things kind of that we're getting more and more australians come in and then the thing that no one really wants to hear, but it is the truth. Um, my dad died and it was in his obituary and everyone started putting drink specials on menus. And that's really how it took off in the UK. Um, yeah. And that's so it's like it's it's not the, the funniest of answers, but it, it's true. That's what happened. Um, and then I have no idea what happened in America, but. Just Neither do we. after COVID, <laughs> um, just after COVID, it really just suddenly took off, um, and I really wasn't expecting it. Yeah, I mean, I I would say that it's partially due to the fact that, well, first of all, it's a delicious drink, but if you didn't have social stimulants, you needed some sort of stimulant, right? And uh, <laughs> espresso martini will surely do that, but it's also the way like the coffee culture in the United States is these days, it just makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I was, a, I was a consultant for Stumptown Coffee for about a decade. And one of the things that I did was I trained all the bartenders or baristas, I trained them as bartenders uh, using the Harry Johnson's bartender's guide for hotels and restaurants. Because that book is like the training manual, you know, this over a hundred year old book uh, just to teach baristas how to act and like bartenders and their tips went up by like 500%. And it was a thing and people started, uh, this is like when people started making like espresso and tonic and like there were certain bar elements that started moving back into the coffee shop and kind of vice versa. So I don't know, there's like, it's always, it's always kind of been there, but you know, as you said, you know, it, it just kind of passed me. And it, I remember when your father died and it, I, my bar was open for about a year or so because it was like 2016, right? Yeah, so it was about a year or so, and I remember we raised a glass for him. And I don't drink coffee; I haven't done it in, since we opened that bar. But uh, but we did make some espresso martinis, and I don't know. It's kind of interesting that you put it that way. That like with your father's passing, it's almost like the you know when a musician passes away, then everyone starts listening to that album, like that that song and that album. Uh, you know, it becomes like a heavier rotation, right? And, and it kind of feels the same way with the espresso martini with your father. I mean, yeah, that's definitely, it really does feel like um, that's what happened. I have this weird thing. I think I'm the only person in the world when they're protecting a legacy is that I try and take him down off a pedestal most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, I get all of these, you know, messages. We've got a thing called the London Bartenders Association, which is our like, main Facebook group. That everyone messages on so you'll see people on there quite often like just talking about this like amazing man and like all this crazy things like oh a great man like dick bradsell wouldn't have called something as simple as the espresso martini the pharmaceutical stimulant is a far more fitting name for a man like him and i'm like i mean he called it the vodka espresso so <laughs> <laughs> um but it's you know it's it's i find he he was a very simple man um he came to work he did his job he liked to make the venue the absolute best he possibly could um, and then he went home and had his mad home life where he was an artist who played Dungeons and Dragons and it was like very separate um, but I think that's what made him so interesting because he was interested in the people that he was making drinks with uh, making drinks for sorry um, like it was always about the guests for him there wasn't really an industry to get into um, right. so I think that's kind of why his drinks have been so successful is because he was making them for the guests, for guests right. all over the world. There was, you know, it was always something that was in the zeitgeist that was pushing him forward. Sometimes it was a new ingredient. Sometimes it was just kind of the vague feel of what people were doing at the time. My favorite one of his drinks um, to talk about is the Russian Spring Punch, um, because it was 
it's just got the best story. No one ever wants to ever do it because it's got one of the worst GP drinks in the world. <laughs> it's, you know, mostly <laughs> champagne and vodka and fresh ingredients. It's just, it's a bit of a pain. Um, it's a, yeah, anything that has 150 mils of champagne is a topper. It's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, so I don't, don't get to talk about it as much as I'd like, but um, it was created for a house party and it was when her, him and his friends were in their 20s and... Um, some of them had found their new careers and were making some good money. Some of them were still finding themselves and really struggling and, you know, still just working kind of their simpler jobs, their minimum wage jobs. And everyone was kind of stopping hanging out together because everyone wanted to do their own thing and live within their means. And one of his friends was just like, I just want all of my friends at a party. Can you help with me, help me with this? Um, so what they decided was to do was to make a punch bowl that had kind of the base ingredients and then everyone bought their own bottle of fizz and if you were doing well and you wanted to bring your bottle of Bollinger you could or if you wanted to go to the supermarket and buy the cheapest bottle of fizz you could you could also come and you'd still get a delicious drink and that's where the Russian spring punch came from and I just like that was how my dad kind of thought about drinks and I just like it's creating drinks for people and so like the, the drink is like the center of the party and that's really how he used to think about them that's really that's that's a really sweet story <laughs> sorry, like, i love talking about beautiful. it <laughs> yeah it's beautiful and especially because like i'm sure that um it wasn't just like everyone's got their own bottle. I'm sure that people were kind of sharing those bottles too, right? I mean, like just because just with the the idea of a punch being a very communal yeah, drinking sure. style, yeah, yeah, that's cool. I love that. Um, I, you know, I mean, I'm sure that that like I don't know. I'm just thinking. I'm, I'm hearing it for the first time now. So sorry, um, but I, you know. I'm sure that really brought that crew back together in a really profound way too. It's like, I love that story. Wow. Good job, Jake. <laughs> I mean, they are all still friends. My mom still sees all of those people on a regular basis. I That's think great. she's living with my godfather who was at that party right now. Oh my God. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, Hey, um, let's take a quick break. Uh, we're going to have to, uh, this, a quick one so we get back because this is really fun talking with you, B. Uh, we want to hear from our sponsors and then we'll continue talking with B. Bradsell on the Speakeasy on Heritage Radio Network. Back in a few. Every glass of wine tells a story. And these stories reveal hidden histories, flavors, passions, and sometimes they unravel our darkest desires. In Wine Enthusiast's newest podcast, Vinfamous, journalist Ashley Smith dissects the underbelly of the wine world. We hear from the people who know what it means when the product of love and care becomes the source of greed, arson, even murder. Each episode takes listeners into the mysterious and historic world of winemaking and the crimes that have since become, well, infamous. This podcast pairs well with wine lovers, history nerds, and crime junkies. So grab a glass of your favorite and follow the podcast to join as we delve into the twists and turns behind the all-time most shocking wine crimes. Follow Vinfamous on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen, and be sure to follow the show so you never miss a scandal. New episodes drop every other Wednesday. Cheers. This episode is brought to you by Cheese State University. Cheese State University was created for dedicated cheese professionals seeking to deepen their knowledge, sharpen their skills, and build connections. It feels like a gift to be able to give this gift to people because I know that from my own experiences, I know how valuable, consolidated, mm -hmm. incredible training resources are. They offer an in-depth education on all things cheese, as well as an active network for peer support and career development. You can pop over to the Quad, which is our social networking and engagement app. Um, and so that's a really fun and dynamic aspect of Cheese State University. Cheese State's three-part course is designed for seasoned pros and entry-level mongers alike and covers all the skills one needs to perform on the cheese counter. The structure of Cheese State University is all based on the Cheese State University Field Guide. Um, and that is a three-volume resource. It's all digital online. 
At the end of the course, students will be ready to ace the field guide assessment and earn their Cheese State Scholar Certificate. Another resource is a video series where we tackle sort of like these thornier questions that you can get on the cheese counter, like what is rennet and like why is this cheese so expensive and can pregnant people even eat cheese? At Cheese State, you're among experts, you're among scholars, you're among cheese lovers, and most importantly, you are a monger. Join them in the Ivy League of Cheese Education at CheeseStateUniversity.com. And we are back. You're listening to The Speakeasy on Heritage Radio Network. And in the studio today, we have, all the way from London, B. Bretzel. We were talking in the first part of the show about your father's legacy, Dick Bretzel. The, you know, we talked about the Espresso Martini, but the, the what kind of caught me in that first part of the show is that you said that it started out in the 80s as a drink that was built on ice. But the way we think about the Espresso Martini like the finished kind of like what it is now and like all the variations, you know, that of this kind of iconic drink. Now it started as something that was just vodka and, and a coffee liqueur and a shot of espresso on the rocks like that, you know, predates everything being served in a martini glass. Uh, <laughs> and, and then later on a coupe glass. But um, I, I just love that because it's straight to the fucking point. <laughs> it's like, all right. Yep. Wake me up and fuck me up. All right, sure. There you go. Here's some vodka. Here's some coffee liqueur. Here's a shot of espresso. And it's kind of interesting to think about that, even in the realm of like, it's kind of like a white Russian, but instead of the cream, you just threw a shot of espresso on top instead, which I, I love that idea. And I think it's interesting when we go back and we think about drinks like the, the Negroni and the Martini and like, you know, those weren't original drinks. You know, they started somewhere and then became that drink. And, this one started there and I don't know, it's just cool. like, I guess we never really think about, you know, when we think about like coffee culture and like espresso machines, like, you know, that's a very European thing. I mean, it's not something that we really, when you, when you said that about this new thing in the, uh, in the bar, having an espresso machine, almost being like a road of app, you know, it, it kind of <laughs> reminds me of like the same, same thing that was going on. And was it 1985? when absolute citron came out and then it was like, everyone started kind of like, they're like, what do we do with it? And so the first thing that they, it's like, okay, let's make a kamikaze with it. All right. Let's like throw some cranberry juice in it. Then you got a Cosmo, you know, it's like, there was, we don't think about uh, oftentimes when you know, we romanticize these different eras of cocktail invention, you know, like the late 19th century uh, American prohibition, even like the mid 19th century, uh, mid 20th century rather um, with like martinis and, and that whole culture and everything but there's some cool stuff happening in the 80s there was some really cool stuff happening in the 80s um, and I mean shameless plug here but in our book that we released last year with McClenny, um Dick Tales um, that's kind of a lot of what it's talking about it's split into different eras and kind of what dad saw going on at the time and it really was this idea of like all these new products were coming out. So he just had this opportunity just to be so creative. I mean, he remembered fresh juices becoming a thing. He remembered cranberry juice being brought to the UK for the first time. These are all brand new things. Um, and it really did let them be as creative as they wanted. I mean, they had, you know, the, the classic hotel cocktail books. And I mean, the, the fine art of mixing drinks was the, the Bible in my household. I grew up with, I mean, I had the fine art of mixing drinks before I had a Bible. Um, <laughs> nice. um, it's, um, and my dad was absolutely obsessed with the book, thought it, nothing could be better. So it took him a really long time to kind of put the idea for what he wanted to do together. And so we, we made it a book of stories with, with drinks recipes as well, but mostly about the stories of the time and kind of what was happening creatively, what they were seeing, what was, what was kind of spurring them on. Because I think especially when you looking at these drinks and trying to put them into context, I think that gets lost a little bit, especially for newer bartenders who um, don't really understand that the cocktail culture that we have now just didn't exist that long ago. Right. Um, I always feel like I'm sounding like I'm an 84 year old woman when I talk about what I started. <laughs> yeah, you're in um, the right place. Yeah. I was just like, you know, it was only 20 years ago that I was starting and there just wasn't any of this. Like you did still have to go to quite nice bars to get cocktails. Um, mm. But they, it had that kind of, it had a lot of that culture of 
invention and you know all these new products that's the bramble um cocktail was created because a new creme de mule came to the market and dad had his madeleine moment transported back to his childhood on the Isle of Wight picking blackberries. And that, that's kind of where that drink drink came from. So it's there are a few things that he created for certain products. Um, and that was one of the things that was brilliant about him is he had this kind of, I don't know, it's I could just imagine it in my head of like, you know, one of those those memes with people doing the, the maths in their head. The minute he tastes something, um, just the, the drink came alive. And he could just do it all in his head. And then he would make a perfect drink first off. Like it would always be drinkable, but then he'd, you know, he'd work on it. He'd develop it. Um, but even like the base one would still be very good. Yeah. Well, I, I, you said something actually earlier about the fact that he was all about the guest experience. And the cool thing about that is like this, you know, speaking of the different areas, like there wasn't like, there wasn't like a lot of press happening for mixology uh during this time right it was it wasn't really the like, bartenders weren't really driven in that way to like become like internet famous or whatever because there was no internet right so like all all these drinks that were being invented it was it was really for the guest experience and i think that's a really important thing for as you as you said like for a lot of the new bartenders that they're you know there's so it's the the industry is saturated in the best way um with with new talent and a lot of new people but like they're they're you know you've got to you know, go back to the basics and understand that it's about the guest experience first right and i think that's what that dick did and that's they've been it's proven itself to be successful yeah i mean that's absolutely was kind of the core of what he believed in was definitely um you know the drinks were one part but having a good front of house person very important to him so I wasn't actually really behind the bar I was allowed to do bars like a, a couple of days a week but he was like no you're going to be trained as a manager you're going to be trained as front of house you can talk to people so that's what you're going to be doing because not everyone is good at this and he actually believed it was harder to find good front of house people that were sure. truly good at it than um than bartenders because everyone wants to get behind the bar um mm -hmm. and there's you know we don't really have maitre d's here as much as you do in america um or you know other parts of the world but so we but you know so managers are quite often the people kind of hosting um but you know a strong front of house team it's getting rarer and rarer because we've got, now got this thing where the the whole bar team rotate everything which i think is good and it can you know it can if you it's treated well the whole team can become stronger and the whole team becomes strong on the bar and the floor but if it's not i've found it a few times where i've kind of tried to manage it and i've had to like fight this idea that like oh i'm just on the floor shift today I'm like no you're like you're doing a completely different guest experience it is very important mm -hmm. and it is almost just as important but i mean for my dad like hiring a dj was more important to him than hiring his new junior bartender he's like i can train the bartender i cannot train the dj to have natural <laughs> talent yeah no it's it's the it's the thing that i always say it's like you can teach you can teach anybody anything except to give a shit you know like you can teach anybody any any skill yeah. well i mean you know there, there is also something to be said for you know natural talent i'm sure i could become a mediocre dj with lots of training but you know it would be <laughs> it would be a lot of it would be a lot probably a lot more work than any bar manager would want to put in um, but this, you know, this, this makes me think of kind of what you're up to now be with your company, the drinks cabinet, because, you know, I've, I've loved looking over like some of your work and some of the, the, um, experiences you've created, some of the products you've done, some of the, the photo shoots that you've done for various drinks on your website, and just the amount of attention to detail to a holistic experience that you all put in. So would you tell, tell us just a little bit about how you came to be uh, there and sort of what the overarching, you know, philosophy of it is and how you execute it. Um, so the drinks cabinet is my company. I'm the entree director for the drink cabinet. Um, I absolutely adore it. It's kind of a job that found me um, kind of accidentally. Uh, so the company's existed for about 10 years. Um, and then I was doing some freelancing bits for them for like judging competitions and things. And then over COVID, I found myself without a job. 
uh, trying to apply for non-industry things and absolutely hating it. And then um, the director, Lauren, came to town and was just like, do you want to go for a martini? And I'm like, absolutely, of course. Uh, and kind of after a couple of hours of conversation, I somehow, and bemoaning how much I actually secretly hated freelancing, um, I get a call three days later saying, do you want a job? <laughs> like, Absolutely. She's like, don't worry, you don't have to move to Scotland. Um, we need we need a London office. We want to be over the whole country. So that's fine. We do, we do work all over the whole country. Um, but it's something I hadn't really thought of doing before is being part of a creative agency. And it's one of the most fun jobs I've ever had in my life. And I really kind of encouraging anyone that kind of thinks service may be not they what they want to do day to day anymore, but still don't want to completely pull out of it. Um, it's kind of perfect for that. So kind of, so I always put it that I have a different job every day. Um, we we are kind of a one stop agency. We do everything from live events to training programs to drink strategies to POS. I mean, we even have a logistics arm now. We do kind of a little bit of everything. Um, and you know, two day in two days, I'm going to be working a trade show. Today, I was working on a new tasting plan for another brand. I've got, you know, one of some of my team are running a product launch for a distillery in one part of the country. Um, I've got other ones collecting a chair from one venue and shipping it to another. <laughs> like it's, you know, we, we, we do a little bit of everything. And it's really just, I get, I still get to stretch my bartending legs. I still get to kind of develop drinks whenever I, like all the time I'm, you know, develop, I get to make at least tools I think I'm doing more drinks creation now than I kind of was when I was in a bar um because it's not just seasonal menus it's 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 a daily thing and it's it's so great to be able to do that and then I'm getting to write training programs and sort of really helping brands get their voice across but one of the things that's really important to us is every single person that works at the drink cabinet has worked in hospitality at some point um uh, because you just we have this kind of ease that everyone just kind of gets it like we're yeah. never going to put forward when we're putting you know ideas together for a new training program or pos we're not we're never going to put something forward that won't work that some bartender is going to get annoyed and be like i didn't need another bar spoon like i've got i've got 50 of those <laughs> i don't need another t-shirt i want you know this is what will actually help us um so that's kind of that's where we're thinking when we come come to it which is great and then um and then we've also just got that kind of inbuilt hospitality drive on event days that we can just get things done and you know we know that we're there till the the bitter end um and the ability just to pivot when you need to because whatever will go you know whatever you haven't prepared for will be the thing that goes wrong and that's right. that kind of mindset <laughs> so we're we're all very good at pivoting and it just means that we're kind of it's a great team to work with because I could know I've just got this like trust that things will be okay with my team, which is lovely. Yeah. Agile. I, yeah, I love that because I've been thinking a lot recently about, because, you know, my, um, I've been a freelancer since uh, March 15th, 2020. Uh, I'm just kind of working <laughs> here and there and work's been a little bit slow lately. And it kind of gives you a chance to, you know, look, gaze deep into your belly button and think, okay, you know, what, what do I, what have I loved from the jobs that I've had? What do I, what do I want to, to really move towards in the future? And yeah, I was thinking I missed that, like, you know, in, in the sort of, you know, work from home freelancer life, I've missed that unpredictability. Like there's something I think that is very attractive to a certain type of person that gravitates towards this line of work where we love that lack of certainty that I think would be terrifying for a lot of, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say most other people, like there's just something that's very nice about, you know, you're doing something different every day and you never know what's going to come next. Like, I think it's, there's a certain part of, of my brain and I'm willing to bet a decent sum of money, yours be, and yours, Damon, that really kind of thrives on that. You know, I don't know what today is going to be like, and I love that thing. That's, I mean, that's absolutely it for me. I, I adore that. That's most what I want to be doing kind of every day of my life is I'll sit down and look at my tasks for the day. I'm like, that is just so not what I expected, but great. Fantastic. <laughs> um, you know, I've suddenly got like, okay, we actually need you in Scotland in two days because you've got to do this in X thing or Y thing. And I'm like, okay. There's this really <laughs> important chair we need you to grab. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's in an ancient tomb. 
Oh, you know what? I have a, there's been. Oh, I really want to know why. I, I loved <laughs> saying ancient tomb and hearing you be like, this reminds me of another fun story. Okay, go, go. I'm, oh, I'm so I mean, excited. It's, it's not that, but like working in Scotland <laughs> and doing kind of fun kind of activations and things, you know, we've done back of beyond to put tents and yurts in the sand on islands, you know, gone to an island to put up a, 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 a a bar and tent and suddenly oh the sea is where we were meant to put the bar down <laughs> good, old, good old scotland uh, you know suddenly having to get the farmers to rake the sand to, be, to get us a path so we can find a new place uh, <laughs> that kind of level of of unpredictability that i absolutely adore um but um, as you mentioned earlier the, the photos we get to do as well which i love being able to kind of really work with drinks photography as well it's something I had a bit of experience with in the past but we get to do a lot more of it now we have our own studio in-house so we do everything in-house we have our own photographers um, we have our own studio um, and so I think the the photos that you were talking about on our website um, that was a project that we got to do over COVID um, one of the things that um, my partner Lauren she's uh, very good at double doubling down on as we'll just work harder and everything's going to be okay. Um, <laughs> so um, during COVID, we were like, we will not be resting on laurels. We, I mean, in the UK, we had a, a thing called furlough. So you basically, companies got to pay their staff to not work. Um, and Lauren's like, we're not going to do that. We're going to work through it. We're going to keep going. Um, so we did lots of kind of fun internal projects. And we basically spent a couple of weeks putting together, like, what's our, what photo shoots do we want to learn how to do? what what do we want to stretch our legs and have more fun doing um because this is the time to learn um so that's what we got to do we did we made a calendar that was our our client gift of the year um and we got to basically put our dream dream photo shoots together and really get creative with it and kind of work out different camera tricks that we wanted to do develop the drinks all ourselves and really kind of each drink we did a year of blog posts that went around the drinks seasonally as well, working with different kind of events throughout the year. And it was such a fun project to get to do. And it's really got on to then. So our team, whenever we've got kind of new client projects coming in, we have stretched those those muscles. We've, we, we know what we're doing um, and we know that we can do it together, which is great. I love that. And and honestly, a lot of the time, you know, I mean, <clears throat> you were talking about how now there's a, a cocktail bar on just about every corner of any any major city um, that you travel to. And it's part of me worries a little bit that like we've reached a, a saturation point, you know, that we've reached a point where, you know, maybe there's there's only there's only so many novel ideas out there that people can can put forward before eventually you're like, eh, this this Negroni riff is really just a Negroni. It's a good Negroni, but it's just a Negroni and I just paid $19 for it, you know? Uh, and and I feel the same with, there are just so many drinks, photo shoots everywhere, but it was really nice to see the creativity. Like, I, I don't remember being blown away by a picture of a drink like I was with some of the ones and the, and the depth of thought that you put into it. And just, I, you could tell how much fun you were having making these things on your website. We'll we'll put a link in the show notes so that, you know, because podcasting is not a visual medium and people are listening to me talk <laughs> about pictures out there for a little while. So you can see them for yourself. But there is something cool about being reminded every now and again for a thing that you've you've been steeped in for most of your professional life that there is still stuff out there that can really, really impress you. I think that's really fun. Uh, that's, thank you. That's so lovely to hear. That was, uh, it was definitely, I, I, I want to say labor of love, but it wasn't even a labor. We had so much fun doing it um, because yeah, we were getting to be creative and it's, and it's also good to be able to share it on our social media because there's a lot of, we do a lot of projects under it. NDA which is you know, a big part of working in an agency so we don't get to often share the photos that we do as much as we'd like um, <laughs> so it was great to be able to, to share those but we've got you know sometimes we'll do a shoot and it doesn't get released for six months to a year so it's, it was great to have the immediacy of it as well um, and now it lives on our website very happily um, and it's, uh, but yeah there's there is there's definitely working in a creative agency I think for anyone that's kind of 
you know, maybe not, as I said before, not 100% wanting to be in service all the time anymore, but still loving the industry, uh, but, but wanting to stretch their legs elsewhere, I think is such a great thing to get into. Um, you know, you don't necessarily need to have a huge marketing background. As long as you've got an interest in it and kind of take note, you can really kind of get into things. You can start doing event side and then move into more of the marketing. That's kind of what we we do a lot of, um, kind of training people up to to get into the other side. And then, you know, one of our main things is every all of our team get poached, which I think we've got to take as a compliment. Amazing. Oh man, yeah. B, B, this has been so much fun chatting today. I wish we had more time, but we're we're kind of at the end of the hour. Um, can we give out your uh, where, where where can people find you? Um, so I mean, I'm on um, Instagram as B Bradsell, just the letter B, and then Bradsell, um, and then um, the drink cabinet is or it's the drink cabinet no s um, dot co dot uk, and that's our website, and then um, it's the drink cabinet underscore uk on Instagram, uh, and then I am kind of around, up and around, and any trade show in the uk, I'll normally be there. Or, um, you know, I try and getting about and doing more international bits whenever I can as well. So I will be at Chalky's event next week on at Little Red Door. Oh, cool. Yeah, very cool. My my uh, coworker will be there as well. He's going to be in Paris. So, yeah, very cool. Um, and that's going to be a great event. I can't wait to hear about how that goes. So, yeah, definitely have have a blast at that. And, uh, well, it's been a blast here today, too. So we're just always having a good time. You know, that's kind of what you were talking about. Yeah, I say this a lot, you know, there's, there's more than, there's a lot more than one way uh, to work in this industry, besides just being behind the bar. And you are a shining example of that. And really, uh, it's really inspiration, like really inspirational to talk to someone like you, who's like, found all these different ways to do the things in this industry that are so much fun. It's a, it's a wonderful industry to work in. And there's a lot of ways to do it. And so yeah, thank you for being here and talking to us about it today. Thank you, guys. Thank you for such a lovely afternoon. Absolutely. Well, morning for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the you know the difference between uh, you being there at uh, five o'clock and me being here at nine o'clock a.m. It's like eh, whatever. We can still have a drink. Um, <laughs> we'll both have a whiskey. Well, this has been so much fun. Thanks again, B, for being on the show. And thank you, everyone who listens out there. Uh, we've been getting a lot of really great comments recently. Um, for people who listen to the show, I know we don't really talk about that very often, but uh, we always love to hear from you. And so a lot of people will send me emails and texts and uh, direct messages. And it's just really nice to hear from the people who are listening to the show. It makes us feel like we're actually doing something <laughs> and people who are listening, which is really great. So thank you to all of our listeners out there. And thanks to Armin, our producer and engineer today. And thank you to everyone at Heritage Radio Network. And until next week, this has been the Speakeasy. Be safe, have fun, and cheers. Cheers. So you don't shun the devil with your rock. The Speakeasy is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food and drink radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. It's gonna get-